I'm just letting everyone through the waiting room and we will get started on time. Thank you so much for being here on time. We, we really appreciate it. Very, very cool. Good to see, good to see some names that I recognize. This is awesome. Awesome. So the goal when I started uh, the Vagina Dialogues was to make sure that everyone understood how important it is to put vulva and vaginal health at the top of our to-do list. So that's what we're going to do. I'm just gonna wait till everyone uh, gets through here before we get started. Boop, boop, boop. And then I can minimize that. And if we have any late joiners, that's okay too. Um, I am curious to know if anybody has already attended the Vagina Dialogues. If you have, let me know. Um, or if you're a first timer, let me know in the chat. Find the chat on Zoom. And um, if you also have brought some questions today that you would like to get answers on or direction to answers, um, pop into the chat and let me know what those questions are too. Welcome, Tammy. Hi, first timer. Nice to have you here. This is my vulva puppet. I'm in love with it. Um, I don't know if you've seen a vulva puppet before. A lot of pelvic floor physios will use it in their teaching. And uh, I have waited for this one. It's hand sewn by a woman named Dory Lane. And it's just beautiful. So I will eventually put it down and get down to business. But thanks for being here. It's amazing. All right. Okay, let's do this. We had... Uh, over a hundred members sign up for today's Vagina Dialogues. And I know that a lot of people can't make this time live, but I love that you're here because that means that I can address exactly the questions that you have about vulva and vaginal health. Um, I think because we have first timers, I am going to go through my slides and, uh, and talk about a number of different topics. You can pop in questions into the chat at any time. And then I'm going to leave a good amount of space at the end for your Q&A. And we will be here for an hour. If you can't stay for the full time, but you've registered, then know that you're going to get a copy of the replay in your inbox tomorrow. Does that sound okay? All right, let's do this. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Vagina Dialogues. My name is Shirley Weir. I'm the founder of Menopause Checks, which is, I'm assuming, how you found us here today. And this is my vulva puppet. I'm really proud of my vulva puppet. Um, and really, one of the biggest reasons for doing this is just to make sure that we all know how to prioritize the health of our vulva, as well as the health of our vagina, internal and external. So let's get started. As I mentioned, I have a few slides that I will uh, go through. We'll talk about prioritizing vulva and vaginal health. We'll talk about what causes vulva and vaginal dryness. We'll talk about all of the ways in which we can prevent dryness and treat dryness. And then we'll, we can also talk about some other um, real priorities for our health as we move through perimenopause to menopause to postmenopause, and that includes or might include for you urinary tract infections. Um, it could also include incontinence or prolapse. So let's get started. Uh, I have a real distaste for all of the uh, pictures that are available for us to use in these presentations, because normally if you uh, Google vagina, you are getting, well, let's just say there's a lot of fruit and flowers and I'm still using fruit and flowers because um, I didn't know that you wanted a picture of my vulva puppet on every screen. Um, I use the terms vulva and vaginal health in most conversations, but I'm including this uh, slide that across the bottom, if you can see it, it says a very long phrase, genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM. Now that is an umbrella term that the North American Menopause Society um, a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, gave to this um, sector of women's health. 
and it includes vulva and vaginal health, but it also includes other implications such as uh, UTIs, urinary and bladder health con or health or concerns or conditions. And so I don't use genitourinary syndrome of menopause all that often um, because I've yet to meet a member who says, oh, hey, Shirley, I'm experiencing GSM. And I have yet to meet a physician who actually uses that in his or her practice when talking to patients too. So um, I like to use the right names for things. And that's one of the reasons why you're probably here as well. First message is the why question. So why is it important for us to prioritize our vulva and vaginal health? Well, it's because, and you might have made a leap to, um, you know, sexual health. Sometimes we equate vaginal health with sexual health. That's not the case. Um, vulva and vaginal health is so much more. We need to be able to ensure for the next five decades that we can all sit move, dance, go to yoga, feel confident and amazing, enjoy penetrative sex if we choose to, wear the clothes or the jeans that we want to and that we feel comfortable in, and we want to be able to avoid UTIs uh, and avoid incontinence and prolapse. I've added a couple more to this slide, a couple more things to this slide as well, and that is do you see how brain health is connected to the word move? And I know this is a bit of a leap, but what is the first thing that a woman does whenever she experiences any discomfort uh, with the vulva or the vagina? Maybe it's a UTI, maybe it's a yeast infection, maybe it's pain or itching, any discomfort at all. The very first thing that we stop doing is moving. And when we stop moving, that impacts our mental health and our brain health. So I like to say, prioritize your vaginal health and you'll take care of your brain health. Uh, sounds easy, right? There's a couple other things too. Um, we really do want to avoid UTIs because, um, and this is maybe a message for someone who is older in your life, a mother or grandmother, older sister, uh, UTIs become more common in women uh, post-menopause or the further they get away from their menopause date. And UTIs uh, have various symptoms. Sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're silent. So I know of a number of cases where uh, women might be showing signs of dementia, forgetfulness, um, confusion, and they get put on the fast track of dementia investigation and miss the opportunity to have a UTI diagnosed. So that's a bit of a sidebar, but I wanna explain why every part of this wheel is important. And then of course, we wanna avoid incontinence. It's very common. It's common to see commercials on television that tell us that leaking urine is just part of being a woman. It's not. It's preventable and it's treatable. And oh my God, it's costly. If you are to be in experiencing a little bit of incontinence, you know, in our, you know, 40s or 50s, um, and you live to be a hundred, that's a huge expense. So we want to avoid that as well. And then there's this reminder that I need to deliver to everyone. There are a lot of things that can come up in conversations about perimenopause to menopause and postmenopause. And many of them come kind of couched in a societal or a cultural um, package of negativity. But many of them also come with a generational myth that things get better with time. So hot flashes, I just need to endure them. I can't wait for them to be over. Heavy bleeding, oh, I can't wait for this to be over. And for all of those things, like not much gets better with time. A lot of things will get better with in, uh, intention, attention, and investment, like really taking care of ourselves. And so if you are experiencing vulva or vaginal dryness, don't put it off. Don't put your health 
on the back burner. Um, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir right now because you're all here uh, and wanting to learn about this, but just pass the word along that vaginal dryness does not get better. In fact, it gets worse with time. Um, so we need to know that. And we also need to know that over 80% of women will experience vulva and vaginal dryness in postmenopause. And here's the real kicker for me is that less than 4% currently have a viable solution. Now, the reason for that is varied. Um, this area of women's health has not been a priority. This conversation has not been a priority in our health appointments with our doctor or quite frankly, amongst ourselves. We have not been talking about it until now. Um, we're crack certainly cracking open the conversation today, but um, that's a big gap. That's a lot of women who feel like they're the only one in the world. Uh, it's a lot of women who are suffering in silence. And it's a lot of women who, you know, we have this opportunity to close the information, the awareness and the education gap. So again, thank you for being here. Let's talk about vulva and vaginal dryness and what causes it. So vulva and vaginal dryness is caused by a number of uh, potential things. Most common or at the top of the list, because it's probably earlier in the timeline, is a decline in hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is a naturally occurring molecule that our bodies produce on their own. Uh, and it helps to keep our skin moist and our eyes moist and our mouth moist. It's even uh, good for our joints and it's great for the skin and the vulva and the vagina. But the thing about hyaluronic acid is that it starts to decline in our 30s and in our 40s. And that's probably why you've seen uh, since 2008, you've seen hyaluronic acid included as an ingredient in beauty and cosmetic products. Um, hyaluronic acid then, you know, starts to decline in our 30s and 40s and goes for a steep decline post-menopause. Uh, fluctuating hormones in perimenopause can lead to dryness. When we reach menopause, there's a significant de decline in estrogen. So when estrogen goes for that decline, that is responsible for vulva and vaginal dryness. It doesn't get better with time. If you've got three to five more decades to live, you're going to want to stay and listen to the rest of this conversation because it's really important that we know how to both prevent and treat it. Other areas or other parts of the timeline where women might be affected uh, with vulva and vaginal dryness include postpartum, anyone who was on the birth control pill, someone who might be going through uh, cancer treatment, breast cancer treatment, even other medications can have a side effect of vulva and vaginal dryness. Certainly other health conditions might and overuse of paper-based panty liners. Um, so young girls, I am um, told are using panty liners like on a daily basis um, because they don't like discharge. Uh, anyone who is experiencing light bladder leakage uh, might be using a, a liner on a daily basis. And what the material in those paper-based pads are doing is they're withdrawing the natural moisture out of the vulva and the vaginal wall. And the way that I would think about that is um, like if you wore a Band-Aid on your hand every single day, the skin underneath there would be dry. And so it's it's kind of similar. So I want to discourage that. And I also want you to know that there are ways to prevent. So I've got P and T on these slides for prevention and treatment. Um, and let's start with um, let's start with where you are maybe on a timeline. If you are in perimenopause, um, it's really great that you're here learning about this now because a couple of the ways in which we can prevent vulva and vaginal dryness in perimenopause is through sexual activity and orgasms. The energy to the pelvic floor, um, whether you're having sex with a partner or by yourself, is really great for the natural production of lubrication in the vagina. 
I say all of that with a caveat um, that if insertive or penetrative sex is uncomfortable or painful for you, then this is not a recommendation. I am not saying endure penetration uh, because it's going to help with lubrication. No, this is only if sex is comfortable and quite honestly, um, sex with or without a partner. Um, second, the second uh, prevention strategy is regular pelvic floor exercise. And if you've been in the menopause chicks community for any time at all, you know, I'm a huge advocate for everyone seeing a pelvic floor physiotherapist. Now this has a P and a T in brackets. That's because working with a pelvic floor physio, having a customized assessment of your pelvic floor, as well as a customized exercise routine for you is a preventative strategy and a viable treatment strategy. So if anybody has any questions about that, let me know, but definitely go see a pelvic floor physio the same way we go see a dentist every year. We need to have um, these professionals on our health team. Number three on the list is moisturizing with hyaluronic acid. Uh, it is also approved for prevention. So it's got a P and treatment, a T. The North American Menopause Society and the International Society of Gynecologists recommend as the first line of treatment that we moisturize with hyaluronic acid. This is Feel Amazing Vulva and Vaginal Moisturizer. It was co-created by the members of the Menopause Chicks community. It was initially um, uh, brought to the Menopause Chicks community in 2019 as a compounded formula. And then last year in 2022, it was approved by Health Canada and to rave reviews by all of the members who are, are currently using it. It is a preventative and a treatment strategy. I started using it. So I'm 56 years old. I reached menopause at 49. So I'm seven years post-menopause. I started using hyaluronic acid as a preventative strategy because I never wanted to experience vaginal dryness. Um, and I don't think that that's selfish at all. I think if you have the opportunity to prevent, do it. But if you are further along the timeline and this is all news to you and you're already experiencing vulva and vaginal dryness, we've got treatment strategies um, coming up next. So number four is hormone therapy. Now, hormone therapy can be both a preventative and a treatment strategy. So it gets a little confusing, but how it can be a preventative strategy is I'll use my example. I was using systemic hormone therapy. Uh, I started at age 48 um, with progesterone, added estrogen uh, after I reached menopause and have been using it systemically since. I believe that that protocol did help with a lot of things, um, but it really did help to prevent vaginal dryness. Now I find that as I'm getting uh, further and further away, like seven years away from my menopause date, seven years in post-menopause, that um, I need more than just a prevention strategy, right? So I am moisturizing um, every day and continuing with my hormone therapy protocol. Then as a treatment option for vaginal dryness, localized hormone therapy, most common would be estrogen therapy, but there is also DHEA, um, which we can talk about more in the Q&A if you like. Localized estrogen therapy, super common, um, no restrictions or guidelines whatsoever for how long a woman can use it. Um, the only thing that you need to know about because we're talking about vulvas and vaginas today, is that most hormone therapies are designed, whether it's a ring or a suppository, some comes in gels and creams for the vagina. So it's inserted and it's taking care of the internal part of our body, but it is often avoiding the external. So that's why you still need to moisturize if you're using um, vaginal estrogen or vaginal hormone therapy internally, you would still moisturize outside. Um, 
Okay, so that's localized estrogen therapy. That's number five. If, and I kind of put these in order, if you've gone through these protocols and you're still not quite feeling amazing, these are like building blocks. So you can keep adding on and keep uh, investigating what protocol is going to work for you. So for example, uh, severe atrophy, you might be interested in red light therapy at home. And so that would be, I think I actually have a picture of it in a, I'll just go grab it right now. This is an example of red light therapy that can be used at home. This is from a company called Joylux. Um, the, the name of the wand is called V-Sculpt in Canada. It's called V-Fit in the United States. It looks somewhat like a vibrator, um, but it has red lights that actually help to restore collagen in the with the vaginal wall so that would be an example of red light therapy and then there is also laser therapy that is performed by uh, a licensed physician or gynecologist in their office and the most common brand name for laser therapy is called mona lisa touch um oh yeah i was going to when i was talking about localized estrogen therapy sometimes it gets really confusing for uh members and they mix when i say estrogen therapy with brand names so I, i'll just throw out some common brand names because that might help you with a dialogue with your healthcare professional so some common brand names for estrogen therapy that's um applied via the vagina would be vagifem Invexi, Estrace, or string, And these are all bioidentical, localized, meaning vaginal estrogen therapies. DHEA, uh, the brand name is Interosa. This has been available in the United States for a number of years. It was just approved for um, use in Canada in November of 2022. Uh, so the brand name is Interosa, and that's a DHEA, which is also a hormone. But when it's applied to the vagina, the body converts it to the amount of estrogen and testosterone that we need. And then in 2023, there is a new oral treatment for vaginal dryness, and the brand name is called Asfina. And I don't know if you're like me or not, but um, I at first was, hmm, how does like taking something orally get to my vagina <laughs> and provide treatment and relief? But uh, oral treatments, oral medications are actually preferred by a significant um, segment of the population because some of these um, treatments are, you know, prescribed to apply at night. Uh, we can be tired. We can forget. We wake up the next day. We're not sure whether we should do it again. And so many women have told me that they really do like the oral option because they can take it in the morning uh, with all of their other vitamins or, you know, it's just part of a, um, a routine for them. So I just thought that I would include that, include the V-Sculpt so that you're familiar Um once again, this is Sheila Zelmer. She's in Newmarket, Ontario, but she's here just to remind all of us that we all need to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And if you, if this is all foreign language to you, um, go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash menopause chicks. I recorded my first pelvic floor physio appointment. Don't worry. There's nothing um, X-rated about it. I just wanted everyone to hear the conversation. The appointment is usually an hour long. Um, about 5% of that is an internal exam. If that is something that you want to do with your practitioner and 95% of the appointment was conversation, information, and education. And it's really an experience that's like second to none. I learned so much and I'm glad that I recorded it. And I do um, hear from a lot of members, it's a few years old now, but I do hear from a lot of members about how that helped them and it propelled or motivated them to go see a pelvic floor physio. Many of you might've already uh, met Kim Vopney. She's the vagina coach. She provides, um, pelvic floor exercises and cons consultations 
online or virtually, and she has an app that's really great. The quality of the exercises are amazing, and you can find her at vaginacoach.com. And I want to talk about uh, something, actually, it just came up in an interview that I did this week, a question about what is the difference between a moisturizer and a lubricant? So remember, I said that the first line recommendation from the North American Menopause Society and the International Society of Gynecologists is to use a moisturizer. But I have heard physicians and healthcare professionals tell women use a lubricant or use coconut oil. And so I wanted to include this question here so that you know the difference. The answer to the question, if the question is, do I use a moisturizer or a lubricant? The answer is both. Um, but here's the differences that you need to know. So you want to moisturize with hyaluronic acid because a moisturizer is an investment in the skin cells. You are putting on a night cream on your face and you're going to sleep and you know, you know that whatever ingredients are in that night cream are working throughout the night um, to support your skin health. When we moisturize the vulva and the vagina, the same thing is happening. Hyaluronic acid happens to be this super strong molecule. It can carry a thousand times its weight in moisture. So when you apply it, you're actually restoring natural moisture back into the skin cells of the vulva and the vaginal wall. Um, when you are using a lubricant, I've got one here. Um, this is from my friends uh, at Okanagan Joy. So it's made with the water from Lake Okanagan here in British Columbia. Um, when you're using a lubricant, it's a one-time use thing. There is no long-term benefit, uh, except you want to use it for that one-time use because it's a barrier to friction. Um, the same way that we put oil in the frying pan when we cook, we don't want anything to stick. And so that's what lubricants are for and the difference between a lubricant and a moisturizer. And of course the answer is both. What else have I got here? Oh yeah, I wanted to just point out if anybody needed, and I can send this to you, you can message me. This is the research that was done by a Swiss gynecologist. Her name is Dr. Petra Stute and her team in 2013. So in 2013, Dr. Stute and her team were the first researchers to show that hyaluronic acid was as effective for the treatment of vaginal dryness as localized estrogen therapy. And that's why I create the menu of options for you, because I want you to be able to have this information and then choose the journey that's right for you. Some women get along just fine by moisturizing with hyaluronic acid. It works for them, prevention or treatment. Others are just starting out and maybe menopause was 15 or 20 or more years ago and they're using the hyaluronic acid and estrogen therapy and that is absolutely just fine. But if you and or your doctor need the research, I'm happy to send it to you. This is another resource for physicians. This is the International Society of Gynecologists. In May of 2021, they recommended to all their members that women use a hyaluronic acid moisturizer as the first line of defense. And the North American Menopause Society has followed. Um, this I was telling you about how we co-created the moisturizer in the Menopause Chicks community. This was the original. This is uh, how it was rebranded in 2022. It was approved by Health Canada. It now has an NPN number, which is a natural product number that can be prescribed by your doctor, but it doesn't need to be. It's non-prescription. It's over the counter. And one of the things that um, is beneficial to using a non-prescription product, aside from the fact that it's for the vulva and the vagina, um, is that you can make up the protocol that's right for you. So if you are you know, using it for the first time and um, extreme atrophy, extreme dryness, um, you can moisturize as often as you like. So although the instructions say once a day, um, I want you to think of it as like if your elbows were really dry. If your elbows were like super dry and cracked, 
you would be moisturizing two to three times a day and knowing that once you got the moisture back in the skin, you could taper back to once a day. And then you'd probably never forget to moisturize your elbows again because you wouldn't want that feeling to come back. Same is true with this. You can moisturize two, three, four times a day to start knowing that once hyaluronic acid does all of that amazing work um, to restore the natural moisture back into the skin cells, then you can taper back to once a day. Some women taper back to every other day, um, which is great. And then it just becomes part of your natural moisturizing routine. So for me, like I shower, brush my teeth, moisturize my vagina and I get dressed and it's just part of um, my daily morning routine. I included this slide because um, when I get asked questions about moisturizers and lubricants, this is a piece of women's health that I had not seen either. And that was, how do we shop for a lubricant? How do we find a lubricant that is actually healthy for our vagina? And what I found out was that even though the World Health Organization has recommendations for pH levels and osmolality um, levels of lubricants, product manufacturers are not obligated to put that information on their packaging. So the best advice, this is really probably fuzzy for you to see, but the best advice is if you can choose a lubricant that does share that information and shows that the pH level um, of their product is not going to disrupt your natural pH level. So the natural pH level of a vagina is, you know, anywhere between four and five or 4.5 and 5.5. And there's many things that can disrupt our pH, like blood and semen and infection and products that we might use. Please don't use any product that's not approved for vaginal use. But What's really important is how healthy our vagina is and how quickly it can resume natural pH level after one of those disruptions. So after a period or during hormone changes or um, after sexual activity, right? So that's what's really important. And you wanna stay away from any lubricant that is maybe peppermint or mint flavored or um, because if, as you can see, they can be far down the end of the scale of pH level and osmolality. And that is going to be harder and harder for your own natural pH to catch up with or return to. Uh, this is a picture that I took in a local pharmacy. It just, it's really frustrating to me because there's all these products and they mix up the words, just like the practitioners I was telling you about who tell women to use a moisturizer for vaginal dryness. Well, it's only like, it's not even moisturizing. It's a lubricant. It's like putting, spraying Pam, you know, to prevent um, fic friction. So I, I really have a hard time with a lot of these marketers that are mixing up the terminology and making our job even harder to prioritize women's vulva and vaginal health. But the other thing that I, um, I shot this picture for is just a reminder to you that, yeah, okay, you see some of the price ranges, but turn the product around, read the ingredients make sure you know where hyaluronic acid sits on the ingredient list. If it's not there, I wouldn't recommend it. And if you have any questions, just reach out and ask me and I can do sort of a comparison. I've done cost per day comparisons. Um, it's just, it's just really important that we use something that's going to be effective. And I feel that a lot of the things that are available over the counter um, are not effective for that long, but they keep us coming back to repurchase them with that hope that eventually it will work. I mentioned off the top that um, that we were going to do uh, include other elements of that GSM or genitourinary syndrome of menopause umbrella. And one of the things I wanted to quickly touch base on where are we at 435 um, is incontinence. So one of the reasons why pelvic health, vulva and vaginal health is so important 
is because we want to avoid these statistics. And when we are moisturizing our vagina, seeing a pelvic floor physiotherapist, uh, having regular sexual activity and that sexual energy, talking to our healthcare teams about vulva and vaginal health, we have this window of opportunity to prevent incontinence. And these are some staggering numbers. 16 billion dollars is the projected size of the market by 2025 for the disposable urinary continence um, pad market. 58% of nursing home residents will be incontinent and be using these products, more women than men. And right now, I think a quick calculation of that is it's around $1,300 a year. And if you multiply that by the next 40 years, it's about $52,000. So there you go. I just saved you $52,000. If you can go see a pelvic floor physiotherapist, uh, moisturize your vagina and take care of your pelvic floor. UTIs, urinary tract infections are something that are quite common, very common, because they result in 8 million doctor visits a year. And if you think about what your doctor has in his or her toolkit, they have a prescription pad. They can write a prescription for antibiotics. And that's great. If you currently have an infection, it needs treatment. Um, but if you have reoccurring infections and you're going back and all you're getting is prescription for antibiotics over and over again, um, that prescription medication becomes less effective over time. So how, what can we do to prevent UTI so that we don't have to face that? I have a really great um, interview with a urogynecologist Dr. Colleen McDermott. If you go to menopausechicks.com and find this graphic, urinary, um, urinary tract infection graphic, there's an article and in the article is a link to the interview. It's amazing. And Dr. McDermott talks about moisturizing your vagina, getting a prescription for localized estrogen therapy and using PACs. And PACs are the, con the most concentrated part of the cranberry um if we had if we took enough cranberry juice if you will it would be the equivalent of drinking 16 glasses of pure cranberry juice a day and nobody is doing that whether it's prevention or treatment um, but taking packs is one way that we can prevent that reoccurrence of UTIs. And I hear from a lot of women, um, some of them in their 70s or 80s, who are just so grateful that they have this information because they're no longer uh, suffering with recurring UTIs. Okay, so I wanted to be done so that I had lots of time for questions. Um, so this is just a little bit of a recap. Um, sexual activity is a prevention a strategy for us to feel amazing. All of us need to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist and moisturize with hyaluronic acid, whether we're in prevention mode or treatment mode. And then also on the menu are systemic hormone therapy protocols, localized estrogen or DHEA hormone therapy protocols. And if those things aren't working, we still have options. Giving up is not on the menu. Uh, we will continue until we find a solution that's right for you. And that might include red light therapy. It could include laser therapy. So I wanna oh, go back to the chat and see what questions you have. I'm going to stop sharing. How's everybody doing? Let me see, oops, I just gotta get rid of that. Um, I got to hop into the chat here and see what your questions are. All right. Does the Feel Amazing moisturizer help with UTIs? No. If you have a UTI, this is not a cure for a UTI or a treatment. But what it does is, and I'm sorry if I didn't explain it in the slides, this is the urethra. So when we're moisturizing, all of this parts, internal and external. So we're going to moisturize from the clitoris to the anus on the outside, as well as inside. Um, we're supporting the health of the urethra. 
and what happens when hyaluronic acid declines and estrogen declines in postmenopause is the urethra gets shorter and smaller. And that makes it more susceptible to infection. So that's why you hear of older women in particular having more reoccurring UTIs uh, than anybody else in the population. And UTIs can affect anyone, male or female, but it happens more often in women in postmenopause. So um, moisturizing with hyaluronic acid, speaking to your doctor, go watch that um, video at menopausechicks.com that I talked about for reoccurring UTIs is part of a strategy to keep the urethra uh, and to prioritize bladder health as well. Um, I am not certain, but I think in passing, I heard you mention that you were reviewing a few types of vibrators. Oh my gosh, I did. I don't even have them here. I've got the boxes somewhere. Um, I'm going to post that video in the menopause chicks community when we get off here. So May was masturbation month, although I don't think it should be excluded to just one month. Um, and I was asked to review two vibrators, the We Vibe and uh, the Womanizer. And I did do a video with my friends at Intimate Wellbeing and I'll post that. Um, picking my favorite was kind of like asking me um, which child is my favorite. Um, but what I hopefully convey in the video is what I liked about each of the vibrators. So thank you for bringing that up. That's amazing. More information on DHEA, please, for the treatment of vaginal dryness. Happy to. I did a complete episode of the Vagina Dialogues in November with Dr. Kelsey Mills, who's a gynecologist and a North American Menopause Society certified practitioner in Victoria. I will um, include the link to that interview with Dr. Mills in the replay tomorrow. I can also just post it in the menopause chicks community when we're done here as well. It's an hour long, but she does an excellent job at explaining all of the options, including DHEA. So thanks for asking about that. Can you use the vaginal, uh, the Feel Amazing moisturizer as well as estriodol vaginal inserts? Yes, you can. And what I would advise you for administration of that is not because there's any interaction. There is absolutely no interaction, but I would suggest that you use both separately. So um, most women who are using localized estrogen therapy, uh, the prescription is two or three times a week at night. Let's just say that that is... Let's just use that as an example. I would use the moisturizer in the morning. And then that allows hyaluronic acid to do its job during the day. And then I would use your estrogen therapy at night. And that allows the estrogen in, um, in that uh, therapy to do its job. If they're used at the same time, it's no big deal. Um, I also know women who will do every other. So on the three days that they're using estrogen therapy, they'll use um, the Feel Amazing on the alternate days. This is non-prescription. You get to make up what works best for you and what feels best. And that might change over time too. So um, the prescription therapy though, don't follow the instructions do follow it as prescribed. Vaginal estrogen has been a godsend, was moisturizing and still do, but this helped with reoccurrent UTIs and dryness and pain. That's such a great testimonial. And thank you for sharing that with me because I love to hear success stories. That's amazing. Is it recommended that women in postmenopause increase their take of soy products in their diet? I don't know. No idea. If you need soy, sure, but not as a um, not as a hormone balance strategy. If that's why you're asking me, uh, I am post. I am ten years post menopause. Is it too late to start Vagifem? No, there Vagifem is a brand name for localized estrogen therapy, and there is absolutely no timeline. Um, this is a really important question, so thank you for asking it. It's important for you and your health. But think about all of our mothers and our grandmothers who need this information. They might be dealing with atrophy. Uh, they might not know about hyaluronic acid. So you have a role in sharing that with them. 
um, they might be suffering with UTIs or pain and discomfort. So it is not too late for them to get a prescription for localized estrogen therapy or just, you know, order, no, not or and like decide what's best for them. But um, during the pandemic, I had an incredible testimonial from a grandmother uh, who um, her only like form of recreation and exercise in the early days of the pandemic was going to line dancing. And she lived in a senior's facility and her granddaughter, two, two granddaughters are members of the menopause chicks community. And one was really concerned because grandma had stopped going to line dancing. And so they, the other granddaughter who really had no trouble having this conversation with grandma said, like kind of did some um, investigation and grandma said, like, it's just too comfortable. I can't wear my, my yoga pants anymore. It, it hurts too much to, to move and dance like that because I'm exposed. She, I don't know if she knew the, the name of it, but because of vaginal atrophy. And so they ordered the Feel Amazing moisturizer for her. And in two weeks, grandma was back at line dancing. And that is so important for her overall health, socially, mentally, physically, all of the above. So anyway, um, thank you for letting me share that story. I haven't told it for a while. And it just kind of brings tears to my eyes every time I think about it. It's not too late for Vagifem. Uh, I have had logging in my end. Can I please have access to your recording after this finishes, please? Um, I, I send a recording to everyone who registers and it comes out 24 hours later. So as long as you're registered and I have your email on the list, then you'll get it at this time tomorrow. Is there hope? Is there hope after 12 years of not using anything? 100% there is hope. There is the only thing that's not on the list of possibilities for you is giving up. You can't give up. If you're in my community, you can't give up because we just keep working until we find a solution. So if you have atrophy, if you are um, 12 years post-menopause or 12 years of not treating atrophy, uh, start right away with the moisturizer and then reach out to me and about what you might want to ask your doctor um, or what steps or solutions are going to be viable and best for you. Okay. My pelvic floor physio suggested coconut oil. Well, coconut oil is um, a food oil. No food oils have ever been tested on the vagina. So we don't think that there's any cause for concern. Um, coconut oil is messy but some people like to use it as a lubricant. Okay, now you see what I did there? It is not a moisturizer. It does the same thing for the vagina as it does in the frying pan. And that is, it reduces friction. So the next time you go back to see your pelvic floor physio, you can share this info with her. When you get the recording tomorrow, you can send her a copy of this video. You can invite her to the Menopause Chicks website or to our community. And I'm happy to set the record straight on that. Um, it's okay. When we know better, we do better. And she might have heard that from another practitioner who heard it from another practitioner. And our job is to break down all of the myths and misconceptions so that you have access to the most quality information. And then you get to choose the journey that's right for you. And if coconut oil is your favorite lubricant, fill your boots, use it for pleasure and fun, and then moisturize with hyaluronic acid as an investment in your skin health. How should I apply estriodol cream? I'm already using Vagifem tablets. Um, so you have to ask your pharmacist because both of those things are prescription and your pharmacist is paid to give you the um, application directions. If that's not going well for you or you've spoken to your pharmacist and you need clarification or questions, message me and I'll be happy to help you. Um, how do you get Feel Amazing Moisturizer? Did I forget to tell you that? The uh, easiest URL is moisturizeyourvagina.com, moisturizeyourvagina.com. And, uh, and you can order 30 grams, which is this size that I'm holding up here. It also comes in 60 grams and 90 grams. So if you're a regular user, 
know that you're going to save significantly on product. Um, when you order the 90 grams, I think you're saving like $41 uh, in product just because they're using one container and shipping it once. And so they give you an excellent, excellent price. Hyaluronic acid is very expensive in its raw form, but that's one of the ways that we can pass savings on is um, in larger sizes. And prices are in Canadian dollars. Shipping is free in Canada when you spend $65 or more, and it's free to the US when you spend 150 or more. We also ship around the world and it free shipping kicks in at $300 Canadian. I had all hormone therapy removed from my body as I had colitis and I had a change in diet and a change in soy and soy has been a savior. Okay. Um, in keeping my vagina lubricated enough to stop and help with vaginal health and give me enough estrogen. Okay, good. I'm glad you found this solution that's right for you. That's amazing. Um, Oh my gosh, it's 10 to five. And we just got through all of the questions. I am so grateful that you chose to put your own name at the top of the to-do list today, to put your vulva and vaginal health at the top of the to-do list. Um, I have an amazing vulva and vaginal guide. It's a glossary and a guide. Um, I'll include that in the email tomorrow too, but you can also grab it from the top of the menopause chicks community. Lots of resources, lots of great articles. And the reason I'm saying that at the end here is because I not only want to thank you for taking care of your health, but I want to invite all of us to share this information. Remember the statistics that I talked about at the beginning. If over 80% of women are experiencing vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy and discomfort, and less than 4% currently have a viable solution, we have a lot of work to do. And we all love a very long list of women. So please do share this with your mother and your sisters and your friends and the girls at work and even your grandmothers. And if there's anything that I can do to support your health or theirs, then just reach out to me and I look forward to continuing to support you on this journey. Thanks for being here. MoisturizeYourVagina.com. That was fun. That was so fun. You're welcome. That was fun. I love the word amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Woohoo! Bye, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>